I can't wait to get to heaven and see my Savior. I can't wait for him to see the works I've done. I know I'm not working to get my way to heaven, but I'm surely hoping that I'm making my father proud. I love that song. I love my family for singing it as well. If you can, uh, as I'll forget to do this, let's uh, open up our Bibles and, and uh, turn uh, to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verse 34 and 35. And if you can, if you want, stand with me, at the reading of God's word. And <clears throat> Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the field for they are white or ready to harvest. Let us pray. Lord God, help us. Help us to have a broken heart, Lord, for souls. Help us, O oh Lord, to have your vision of people. Help us, O oh Lord, Heavenly Father, to look to the fields. Lord, Heavenly Father, you say they're, they're white unto harvest, Lord, Heavenly Father. Help us to see there is a harvest. Lord, will you break our hearts for our loved ones that are lost and on their way to hell. Break our hearts for our neighbors and coworkers, O oh Lord. Break our hearts for the inner cities and the countries and the shore sides, O oh Lord. O oh Lord, Heavenly Father, I do pray that you would speak to each and every one of us tonight. I pray, Lord God, that you would hide me behind the cross and that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and speak through me, O oh Lord God. May I say all that you want me to say. May I make you proud. O oh Lord God, have your way with me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Guys can be seated. <clears throat> I would like to share my testimony with you all. And uh, I, I grew up in Chicago. I grew up uh, in in a, in a time where my mother and father was a both both was a part of starting what they considered or called an organization, um, but what the world would call is a gang. And uh, understand, they, they started this organization and they, they thought that they, they was doing something good for the community. They, they did it in a way to protect the community from a lot of crooked cops and, and, and a lot of other outsider influences and gangs and, and uh, mafias and stuff like that that was coming in and damaging the communities. And, um, and so they, they thought that, you know, they was doing something good, something noble, you know, more so like the, the Black Panther movement, you know, that they was being uh, revolutionizing uh, the communities. And so they, 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 uh, they wanted and encouraged all of their children to follow down this same pathway. And uh, there was no exception for me there either. Uh, but my mother... My mother was uh, addicted to crack cocaine, and my father was an alcoholic. And, uh, and, uh, and <laughs> I'm just thinking the fact that he's going to probably be watching this sermon. So. But uh, this is the truth, amen. And, um, and, and, and uh, they didn't stay together long. You know, a mix like that don't stay together long. And uh, so my mom was uh, what we consider a statistic, uh, ra single mother, on welfare, raising four children in Chicago. And uh, one of the ways that she was able to manage uh, income was government assistance. But another thing that they did, uh, the black community, uh, my community, the community I came from, was they would have all of their children on SSI. <clears throat> and in order to put the children on SSI, and make about 900 some dollars a month, the child had to have a learning disability or they had to have a mental health problem. And my mother had us pretend to have both. And let me say this, <clears throat> I started out pretending until I actually did have some real problems. You know, you can't pretend to be dumb for too long and get bad grades before you really can't read and really can't spell and, and really can't uh, do math and things of that nature. And so 
I followed down that path and and it was very damaging for me. By the time I was in fifth grade, I had my first run in with the police. I had brought a firearm to school trying to do do harm to someone. I was at 13 years old or 10 year 10th grade at 13 years old. And um, <clears throat> about time we got kicked out of Chicago, we moved up to Minneapolis, Minnesota. I tried to continue to commit the crimes I was doing there. Found out <clears throat> about child services or DCFF <clears throat> that my mom couldn't uh, beat on me like she used to. So found out that I could call DCFF and and, and when I started using that as a threat, you know what she did? She turned around and uh, dropped me off at the psych ward, telling them that I was having an episode. And given the fact that from a young age, she had me going in these doctor's office, acting a fool, you know, pretending that I had some type of uh, psychological problem. Uh, she didn't really have to do much to convince them to take me in for a 30 day evaluation. I absolutely, absolutely hated going to the psych ward. First, I, I didn't belong there. Second off, I hated the fact that even though I said I didn't belong there to them, they, they said everybody says that. And so they just gave me drugs. And I hated the effect that it had on my body. I hated the effect that it had on my mind. I hated the effect that it had on my whole entire life. And I found out fairly quick that instead of going to a psych ward for a 30 day or a 60 day or three month evaluation, I could just commit a crime and go to juvenile. And so uh, it, it, that became my haven. Going to juvenile and getting locked up was a, 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 a safe place for me. And so I would do that. I would just commit a crime whenever um, I know that it was coming, that my mom would have me in a psych where I would just I would just go out and commit crimes. I would go on sprees and sprees. And so from the age of 13 to the age of 18, I had a couple weeks free, uh, but the rest of that was locked up somewhere some juvenile, some psych ward, or some boy's home, some, you know, uh, 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 out-of-home placement. And um, by the time I turned 18, I, I actually turned 18 locked up, and I had got released from the juvenile facility on my 18th birthday because I was too old to be in the juvenile facilities anymore. And uh, I was out. Less than a month later, I was arrested again for first degree aggravated robbery, first degree kidnapping, first, first degree assault with a deadly weapon where I would go on to take a man and try to, try to take him to a bank and rob him. And uh, the judge threatened me, said, hey, listen, this is your first adult offense. If you, if you do something again like this or anything, you're going to prison. And, uh, and, and so the judge threatened me and, and gave me six months in the workhouse. And, and uh, what she didn't know was that I was not afraid of getting locked up. But she threatened me, sent me off to the workhouse. I went to the workhouse, did that time. I got out January, February. I was locked up for a shooting. And I thank the Lord that he protected the young man that I shot. But now I was 18 years old, going off to prison and in prison. I just got deeper and deeper and deeper into this gang lifestyle. You know, they call it the correctional facility. I've never seen it correct anybody. But anyways, it, it, it was a place that I consider a grooming place. It groomed me for the lifestyle that I was living. It sharpened my skills and my tools to be able to do violence and get away with crimes. And... Um, Due to the riots and due to the assaults that I was doing inside of the, the, the prison, I got kicked out and sent to a place called Oak Park Heights Maximum Security. Uh, one of the, 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 the United States, one of the maximum security prisons in, in America. And I ended up there where I would go on to spend three years and four months of my life in solitary confinement. I hated it. I almost lost my mind in there. And... um. And so I got, I got released from Oak Park, from the hole to the streets. And, you know, I, you, can you imagine what happened? 
I got out, got a job, and, and did well. No, 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 no. I went right back to the street life, went right back to the crimes, went right back to the robberies, the drugs, the alcohol, and all of that. And, and I added to my record at that time soliciting women. And while I was like living this, this life, wrapped up in my own world, it was around that time that I had got reacquainted with Samantha. I knew her when we was uh, kids. I, I went to church on one of the bus programs they had. And I just want to say this. Thank the Lord for bus workers. Thank the Lord for the candy bars. Hey, listen, church, don't ever stop buying candy bars for kids. Hey, you never know when that payment is going to pay off. But uh, I ended up going to a, a, a church when I was a teenager, in between that time I was free, uh, you know, for the candy bars, and I had met my wife at that time. Now, Samantha, she grew up in a Christian home. Her mother got saved out of, uh, from a native reservation and out of that, that whole uh, 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 life of gitchy money do and all of this stuff. Her, her dad brought her mom to church trying to tame her down, and she ended up getting saved and, and, uh, and she took off with the Lord. She was serving in every ministry. She was singing in the choir, running the vans, cleaning the church. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, they get saved and they just on fire for God. They, 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 they just got in on something good and, and praise the Lord for it. And so this was my wife, mom. And her dad was serving and he was deacon and this and that at the church and, and a church of our stripes and and everything like this. But my wife was not saved. And, and I just want to say this for you all. We examined her life and we want I wonder, like, what went wrong? Because she ended up turning 18 and leaving the church and running the streets and and doing a whole lot of other stuff. You know, she ended up in a relationship with me while I was uh, living that life. And so uh, so we, we examined her life and wondered, like, what went wrong? And what we discovered was that though her parents was in church and she was in church her whole entire life, it was a contradiction at home. They, the music was, there was no standard on the music at home. There was no standard on what they watched at home. There was no standard or guidelines on what friends' houses she went to and hung out with. And let me tell you something, our children are prone to sin they're sinners like us. We can't expect them to do better than we do. And, uh, and if you start putting the temptation in front of them, they're going to bite it. They're going to take right off. And so my wife, growing up in a, in a good, godly home, I love her mom and dad. They still serve in the Lord to this day. Um, they're phenomenal people. I love them dearly. But, but she wasn't saved, and part of it was the influence of her, her life. So we ran into each other. At this time, I was living in this life, and, and uh, she took one look at my life and was like, no, I don't want nothing to do with you. She saw the drugs, she saw the crime, she saw the women, and she wanted nothing to do with it. And so, you know, in 2 Corinthians, the Bible says this. It says, uh, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The Bible teaches us that clearly this thought that if a person is not saved, the, the devil hides this gospel from those people, and so they're blind, and I was blind as a bat. I tell you that. To get Samantha, because I, I was pursuing her, I decided, I created this plan. I would go back to prison. That, that's crazy, right? Are y'all with me? I, my plan was I'll go back to prison. Who, who does that, right? And, uh, and get rid of the women in my life so that uh, I can try to pursue her. And that's what I did. I went back to prison, got rid of the people in my life. And when I came home from prison, I called Samantha. I said, hey. This is your first love, your true love, your only love. Who am I? She said, is this Tyrone? I said, yes, it is. Can you come visit me? And she came to visit me. And what she brought with her was invaluable. She brought the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with her. 
At that time of her life, she was going to school to be a police officer, and I was second in command of a gang. And uh, I was trying to get her to rob the evidence room, and she was trying to get me saved. <laughs> and so we, we had an interest in one another. <laughs> um, I thank the Lord that I didn't win. But uh, <clears throat> we moved in together. Like I said, she wasn't saved. And, and, uh, and one night on my way to commit this crime that surely would have cost me my, the rest of my life in prison, I thank the Lord that he stopped me and had me arrested. And, um, and when I got arrested, it set several things in motion. One of the things that set, was set in motion was we got uh, evicted from the place we was living. I was the only, I was the sole breadwinner with my uh, criminal lifestyle. And, and so Samantha couldn't keep up with the place and she, she was getting evicted. And then, um, and then also it set in motion her ability to get a hold of my phone. And, uh, and while she was uh, in, a, in a homeless shelter, she ended up crying out, out to God and getting saved. She knew what she had to do. She knew she wasn't saved. She knew she wasn't right with God, got saved. And, uh, and, and by the time she came to visit me, she had found out about my infidelity as well. And so she came up to visit me. At this time, I was facing 15 years in the feds and 20 years in the state. And uh, she came to visit me. And she was calling me out on this. And I told her, I said, you know, you don't need an excuse to leave me. I know how this goes. If you're going to go, just go. And I will never forget this. She looked me in my eyes with the most perplexing look. Leave you. Leave you. I'm a Christian. I'll never, I'll never leave you. That was the first time anybody declared to me that they was going to stay in my life. The first time. From the time I was young and getting locked up, my mother wasn't there. My family wasn't there. Nobody was there. This woman declared she was going to stay in my life. And she said, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to leave you. You know, and that set in motion a conversation that I end up having with the Lord that night. How do you love me, Lord? When you keep letting me get locked up, the Bible says that they are blind. Amen. I was blind. I thought it was God's fault for me getting locked up. How do you love me, Lord, when you won't let me get away with these crimes? How do you love me, Lord? I'm being true to who you made me to be. Can I tell you? Can I really tell you guys? I was so blind that I was thinking to myself at that point in time in life that life was all about how it ends. And I was eager and excited for it to be said I was loyal to the streets and that I died for the cause. I wanted them to celebrate at my funeral with drugs and alcohol. I was looking forward to that, sadly, but true. And so I thought the Lord built me for this life and I was true to it, loyal to it. And, and he was the one who was betraying me. And uh, it was almost as if the Lord said to me, not audibly, but he said to me in my mind, You've been loyal to the streets. You've been loyal to your homies, but you've been disloyal to me who died for you. That was the one thing there that broke me when I came to the realization that the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the omnipotent one who reigns, I've been disloyal to him. Here I am thinking I'm just the most loyalist person in all the world. I've been disloyal to the, to the God of heaven. It broke me. I end up getting saved that night. And I tell you, I got gloriously saved. I tell you, I thank the Lord I got saved. Amen. And some of you guys thank the Lord too, right? Otherwise, you'd be gripping your purse tighter. No, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but praise the Lord, I got saved. I got gloriously saved. Can I tell you, I became a new creation in Christ Jesus. I was lying about the charge that I was locked up for. I ended up losing parental rights to my oldest son, Leviticus. He's 17 years old. I lost parental rights to him. I was lying about the, the gun charge they charged me with that night. And I was telling them that it wasn't mine. And, and by the time I made it to sentence, after I got saved, God had worked so much in my heart that I was eager to come to court to tell the judge the truth. You know I got saved. <laughs> I stood up there and said, Your Honor, I got something to tell you. She said, well, I was looking, I was going to get a year and a day. 
until I got saved. <laughs> That's the truth. I ended up getting four years because I told the truth. But I thank the Lord that I did that. And let me tell you, it's far better to have no hindrance between you and your Savior than it is to get a few extra years free. Amen. I was happy that I got four years and I was able to get a clean conscience as well. And so tonight, I want to, you know, just, just think about that testimony for a moment. That's who I really was. My son who's gone, you know, he's, not, he's still alive, but he's not living with us. And, you, and when you just stop to think about the fact that this family sung up here tonight, I saw Jesus in you. You guys got a chance to meet my pastor, Dr. David Swanson. You got a chance to meet my kid's grandfather. What is the likelihood for an uneducated black man from Chicago, Illinois, tatted up over 13 years of his life in prison, jail, and mental institutions to be standing here today with this family. I thank the Lord that I got saved. I thank the Lord that he did something in my life. Tonight I want to preach on why we must send and why we must go. Not why we should think about it, consider it, ponder it, but why we must send and why we must go immediately. You know, one thing was that the Lord laid it on our hearts June, the first, the first week of June to move to New Jersey and everything said no. I mean, pastor was like, are you serious? You're taking my grandkids out there. The, the, the YouTube uh, 10 reasons why not to move to Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, the crime rate is 400% higher than a national average. I mean, everything said don't go. But the first week the Lord laid it on our hearts, we started making preparations because we wanted to be obedient to him by the last week of that month. And we didn't let nothing get in our way to stop us from going. This is why we must send and why we must go. Number one, we must send and we must go because there is a harvest de that demands it. Understand something. He says here in John chapter four, he says, uh, uh, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish it. He says, don't say that there's still four months to come. He said, look up. For the fields are white as already unto harvest. The Lord Jesus is saying to them, he said, hey, listen, understand something. Don't sit around being idle, waiting for a perfect time to jump into the ministry and serve me. He said, look up and get busy today because there is a harvest today. In Matthew 9, he says, and then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. There's, there's uh, over uh, 90,000 people living in the eight square miles of Trenton, New Jersey. Who now, as I already said, the crime rate is 400% higher than the national average. And some people will be repulsed by that. But let me tell you what I see. I see a field white as already on the harvest. I see a harvest out there. Ah, sure, I see the young men out there that's tatted up. Sure, I see the young men and women out there who's on the corner. Sure, I see the drug addicts out there. Sure, I see the violence out there. But when I look them in their eyes, I see me. And I know, I know what the Lord can do. There is a harvest. There is a harvest. He says, understand something. The harvest is, is plenteous. This isn't an issue on if there's a harvest. This is an issue on laborers. Who is the laborers? Those who've received this sweet gift of salvation. We are called to be laborers. He said, it's not an issue on if there's enough sinners to be saved. They're all out there. They're all over the place. It's the issue on getting my children to get busy and understand that there is a harvest. 
to be had. There's a harvest. We don't have a shortage on harvest. We have a shortage on labors. The Lord Jesus himself said, pray, pray for more labors. We must send and we must go because the harvest demands it. I wonder what would have happened if Samantha would have listened to the counsel of so many people who said, it's just a jail conversion. It, it's not going to amount to anything. Just leave them. You won't regret it. She came and married me while I was in prison. We just did our 10-year vow renewal. Dr. Sorensen was the one that, that officiated that. And, and um, we, we had this magnificent uh, wedding I mean, we had everything. I decked it out as much as I could. The Lord gave me the money. I did all I could to show her, hey, I love you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. But in, in, the, in, the, in the prison, we, can bear, we, we couldn't even stand up and kiss when we said our vows. We had to sit across from each other with the, with the preacher right here. But what if she would have yielded to any of that counsel? May I ask you sincerely, where would I be today? May I, may I ask you, where would my seven children be today? Perhaps they will be like their brother Leviticus, lost in the world. From home to home, place to place. Where would Gideon and Elias be? Perhaps they would just be prepping themselves to be the next game leaders. If she would have listened to the council if she would have not seen that there was a harvest to be had in my life. We must sin and we must go because the harvest demands it. And then number two, we, we must sin and, and we must go because the hour determines it. Understand, the hour determines it. This is why we must. The hour determines it. In Romans 13 Verse 10 through 11 says, love work of no ill to his neighbors. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. We must all understand something that the Bible is very clear. It is appointed on the man wants to die. We, we understand this, right? That, that no man know the day nor the hour of the return of Christ. And, and may I submit to you here tonight, uh, beloved, that no man knows when they will take their last breath and the reality is is that there is coming a time though where every man woman boy and girl will die if the Lord Christ shall not return and, and but here's the reality how many of us sit here with loved ones who are on their way to hell and maybe if today they took their last breath they will be there but the reality is we need to get busy immediately because the hour the hour determines it our determines that the Lord Jesus Christ told us to occupy until he comes. That means get busy, get to work until I return. Sad to say, I watched so many of us just sitting, waiting for him to return. Oh, and our comments would be, I just can't wait till he comes back for me. Yeah, I can't wait either, but what you doing while you waiting? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Them soapbox can go off while you wait. <laughs> you can go tell somebody. If you're that excited about him coming, you can start passing out tracks unafraid, unashamed. <laughs> we can get busy for the Lord. We, the world is crooked. The world is chaotic. Oh, I can't wait till the Lord returns. Yes, it is. But perhaps you can go out there and be a light in the midst of a dark and dying world. We know that the hour is coming where the Lord will return, but, but while we have time, while we have air in our lungs, will we get busy for God? He says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. 
There's coming a time when we can't send any more of our resources to the work of the ministries. There's coming a time when we can't go anymore. There's coming a time when we won't be able to knock on another door or witness to a loved one. And, and let me say this, beloved. We're called to be the light of the world. Listen to me here. This, there's no greater organization. There's, we're not even an organization. We're, we're a live organism. There's no greater place than the local New Testament church in all of the world. This church has been called out and commissioned to go and be a light in the midst of a dark and dying world. We are the greatest army in all of the world. There's no greater army than this army here, the church, the bride of Christ. He's given us marching orders four times in the, in the, in the Bible. Go ye therefore, go ye therefore, go ye therefore. He told us, uh, he, get busy until I come back for you. I'll go and prepare a place. You get busy. Stay focused on that because, uh, uh, because there's coming an hour where you won't be able to do it any longer. After I got saved, I did all I could to continue to be a light in my mother's life. I wanted to witness to her and all of my siblings, and I was just telling him about how I came to a Christmas thing with my family. And I, I don't like to subject my children to all of my family, but I'm willing to sacrifice to be a light in their life. And, and, and sometimes I got to get over my preference and things of that nature so that I can be a light. Uh, uh, and so... Um, I preached and, and about 15 of them uh, uh, prayed to get saved that one Christmas. And but but nevertheless, I tried to be a light in my mother's life. And um, and my mom just, uh, you know, she was still doing the same thing. She had adopted like uh, seven or eight of my nieces and nephews. And she had them all on the same roller coaster. And, 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 and it's it's common. It's very common. What I what I talked about with my testimony is common, very common. And uh, she was doing the same thing, and and one one time one one time or another, I end up seeing the fact that it was it was dangerous for one of my nieces, and, and so uh, you know the Lord had led me to to confront my mother on this topic, and I went to her asking her if she'll let me take my niece, and when she said no, I said, Mom, can I sit down with you, and, and tell you how my upbringing was from my lenses. And she said, sure. And we sat down. And the moment I started telling her, she completely shut the conversation down and kicked me out of her house. She didn't want to hear none about it. She, she, you, you blaming me for, well, <laughs> you had a part in this all. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and um, that was that. But before I left her home, I said, Mom, understand that, you know, I'm a mandated reporter. You know, I'm a servant of the King of Kings. I'm going to have to I'm going to have to call child services on you and let them know what's happening here. I did it because I have a responsibility to witness to my nieces and nephews and reach them. But I a responsibility to God and in reality is my mom. The Lord has been working on her far longer than he was working on me. And so she got mad about it. I called child services. After I left her house, I called my wife and we, we just cried over the phone. I love my mom dearly. I, I, I wanted to, nothing more but to see her saved. But the reality is, is that she shut me out of her life after that. She would never talk to me again. Never. She wouldn't, she wouldn't text with me, talk with me or any of this. And she ended up in a coma and they, they, they didn't even call me right away. I had to find out by somebody else. And, and finally, when I got there... You know, uh, she was she was beyond the point of, of saving. I stayed up all night praying over her bed, begging God to to wake her up just so she could receive Christ. You know, um, if we have loved ones who we have ought with, remember this. We're called to be intentional in our relationships with people. If it requires you getting on your knees and begging them to forgive you so you can be a light, do it. It's not worth them being in hell for all of eternity and you having that conscience. I did all I could to win my mom to Christ. And, and uh, in June of 2019, on my birthday, she ended up slipping into an eternity. What I truly believe is, is hell. That, that, that burdens me. Understand there's people who are dying 
right here, right now. The hour determines that we must send and we must go immediately. And then lastly, we must send and we must go because the heartbeat of God demands it or the, uh, the heartbeat of God directs it. We must send and we must go because the heartbeat directs it. Second Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some man count slackness, but as long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord desires for every man, woman, boy, and girl to come to a place of repentance. Think about this. The heartbeat of the Lord Jesus Christ is sinners. He, he was born in a manger he lived 33 sinless years for what reason? He allowed him, himself to be uh, uh, arrested, to be spit on, to be mocked, to be whipped, to be smoted, to be, to be embarrassed. He allowed them to, to take him and, and, and make him carry a cross. He allowed them to, to nail him to that cross and, and suspend it in the air. He prayed for those folks to get saved. The, the, the reality is, is we must sin and we must go because it is the heartbeat of God. It is the heartbeat of God. It, it's, by time, it, it's time that we stop saying, I love the Lord, I love the Lord, I love the Lord. And, but then what our Lord love, we don't love. He loves souls. And yet we get so high minded and judgmental that we start casting people to hell before they ever get there. We think to ourselves, well, look, look at him. He's he's tatted up. He there's no hope for him. Uh, you know, uh, what kind of job do you have? You got a good job. OK, well, there's some hope for you. Let me tell you about the gospel. What about the ones that he says go into the highways and the hedges and the bypasses and compel them to come that my house may be full? It is the heartbeat of God to save folks like me. I don't know if Pastor Swanson told you guys about the Satanist my wife and I led to the Lord several months ago named Vince. But he has 666 tattooed over his eyebrow and devil horns tattooed on his forehead. And, and uh, he was, came from the native reservation and, 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 and he allowed us to bring him to church. And, and then he got gloriously saved. He was a, a, a Satanist for 13, 12 years. And, and he was a meth addict, full blown meth addict. I mean, having hallucinations and everything. And uh, where most people would have looked at him and prejudged him and condemned him to hell. He actually came, got saved and that man has radically made a change in his life. No, no, no. The Lord has radically made a change in his life. He's dressing in a suit like us, and, and he's over there singing the hymns like us, and he's over there uh, uh, soul winning like us, and door knocking like us, and he's just so faithful to the house of God. The church never had the change to reach me or him or countless other people that are in our church right now. The church remained the same, but let me tell you what they did. They preached the gospel to every living creature. That's what we must do. We must sin and we must go because the heartbeat of God demands that we go. You know, while he was hanging on that cross, I truly believe he was there on another mission to win a thief to himself. Today, thou should be in paradise. I truly believe that he was suspended there hanging on that cross, bearing my sins. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is his heartbeat is for me, for my children, for you, for the lady with the issue of blood. For the young boy who kept falling down into the fire. For the maniac of Gadara who was running around the tombs, cutting themselves and naked and wounded. His heartbeat is, is for Peter, people like Peter who will go on to deny him to come to a place of a saving knowledge of himself. His heartbeat is to save the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We must send and we must go. Because the harvest demands it. 
The hour determines it and the heartbeat of God directs it. I want to read one last verse with you all. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. We're called to be the light of the world. You know, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Can you find any other establishment that would be true for? That's not true about our homes. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true about uh, our workplace. That's not true about a nightclub. There's power in the church. And let me just say this. Let me warn you, be careful about removing yourself from the church. Be, be careful. Let me tell you something. If you just decide to walk out of the church and never come back, I weep for you. I weep for you. There's power in the church. The church is the greatest place in all of the world. It's the bride of Christ. It's the greatest army in all the world. We've been handpicked and selected by God. He desires to save the whole entire world. The fact of the matter is we received it. And so therefore we are here and we've been commissioned with the greatest task in all of the world. Not to run inside of a fire, a burning building or or to to run and and, and fight on crime. But we've been called to rescue souls from from hell. And this job that we've been given by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We take it sometimes for granted. I have to do this. I have to do that. (laughs) Some young man asked me today, so you got to go and preach tonight? I said, <laughs> no, I don't. But I, I, get, I, get to, I get to. I get to serve the Lord with my family. We, we was praying before we came out here, praying that God would empower us. Praying that it would be fresh. Reminding ourselves that every time the word of God is open, It's landing on hearts and minds and ears that the Holy Spirit of God has been working on specifically. We was reminding ourselves that each and every single person that will be here tonight carries a different burden. Perhaps it's cancer. Perhaps it's the death of a loved one. Perhaps it's some type of sickness that you can't get rid of. Perhaps it's uh, facing homelessness or, or being arrested. Perhaps it's a sin that just so easily beset you. You've tried all that you could to get rid of it, but it just won't go away. There's people here tonight that is burdened and weighed down by sin, guilt, remorse, and so many different trials and tribulations. One of my greatest joys is the fact that we was upstairs praying for this meeting tonight. I I pray that we don't just shed tears. I pray that we don't just say amen. I pray that as the word of God have been spoken and we've been moved, that we make decisions that will change our lives, radically change our lives. We must sin and we must go. Okay, enough with the agreeing. Will you continue to be idle? Or will you go? I'm praying that God will get a hold of our hearts while there's still time. And that we will make a change in our life. In Matthew chapter 25, verse verse 42. For I was a hunger and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you took me not in naked, and you clothed me not sick and in prison, and you visit me not. Then shall they uh, also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hunger or a thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee? They, they said, hey, well, when did we ever see you like this and didn't uh, assist you immediately? When, when? When did we see you hungry and didn't feed you? Naked and didn't clothe you, in prison and didn't visit you. In their mind's eye, they never seen him like this. Sure, 
he goes on to, to say unto them that uh, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to the one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. We must send and we must go because this is the purpose that Christ has left us here for. There's no greater purpose than this, to serve the Lord with gladness. Lord God, I pray now that you would speak to our hearts and minds, Lord, that we would be moved, O oh Lord God, that we would repent, O oh Lord, of our sins and clean our debt with you, O oh Lord. I pray, O oh Lord God, that we would that we will be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to go to sin. Lord God, not everybody can go out door knocking, but they can pray. They can, they can send, they can give. Lord, we can fast over real issues and real people who will be in a real place called hell. Oh, Lord God, do a great work. And for those who are here tonight that may not know you as the, their Lord and Savior, I pray, Lord, that you would get a hold of their hearts and may they understand that they must come forth. They must come forth, Lord, now while they still have time. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives and in the life of this church. Oh, Lord God, pray now that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.